Good afternoon, everybody. This is a quick announcement about language services. Buenas tardes con todos. Para esta presentación se van a proveer los servicios de interpretación al español en simultáneo. Para acceder al canal de interpretación, en unos minutos usted observará en la barra de herramientas en la parte inferior de su pantalla el icono de un globo terráqueo. Al darle clic al globo terráqueo, usted va a poder seleccionar su idioma de preferencia. Gracias. Albert, I'm ready to be added as an interpreter. Good afternoon. My name is Sean Gilbert. And on behalf of the Contra Costa County Library, the League of Women Voters Diablo Valley, the League of Women Voters West Contra Costa County, and Contra Costa County, um, excuse me, Contra Costa County TV. Welcome to today's community conversation webinar, What is the Reality of Immigration? Before we begin, I would like to review a few housekeeping items. This is a Zoom webinar, so the audience microphones are muted and the videos are turned off. If you have any questions for the moderator or panelists, please submit them using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. A member of the team will share your questions with the moderator during, during the Q&A portion of this presentation. This webinar is being recorded and it will be posted later to the YouTube channels of the Contra Costa County Library and the League of Women Voters Diablo Valley. Site addresses to those YouTube channels will be displayed on the screen at the end of the program. Additionally, Contra Costa Television is broadcasting this webinar today and will rebroadcast the program. The dates and times will be posted on your screen at the end of the webinar as well. Contra Costa Te Television is available to watch on Comcast Channel 27, AT&T UVerse Channel 99, Astown Channel 32, and online at ContraCostaTV.org. The contact information for our panelists and the date and subject of our next community conversation will also be posted at the end of this program. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan grassroots organization working to protect and expand voting rights and ensure everyone is represented in our democracy. We empower voters and defend democracy through advocacy, education, and litigation at the local, state, and national levels. The League of Women Voters of the United States believes that democratic government depends upon informed and active participation at all levels of government. We invite you to join the League of Women Voters and support our work. You can join the League by visiting lwvc.org join. The League's Statement of Position on Immigration states, the League of Women Voters believes that immigration policies should promote reunification of immediate families, meet the economic, business, and employment needs of the United States, and be responsive to those facing political persecution or, excuse me, humanitarian crises. Provision should also be made for qualified persons to enter the United States on student visas. All persons should receive fair treatment under the law. The League supports federal immigration law that provides an efficient, expeditious system with minimal or no backlogs for legal entry of immigrants into the United States. It is now my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Ali Saidi. For over 20 years, Ali Saidi has been using both litigation and policy advocacy to fight for community members dehumanized by our systems of mass incarceration and mass deportation. He specializes in anti-racist approach to the intersection between criminal law and immigration law. In 2016, he spearheaded an advocacy campaign which led to the creation of the county's rapid response and immigration legal services program, Stand Together Contra Costa, of which he now serves as the director. In addition to his service at the Contra Costa County Public Defender's Office, Ali is a founding and active member of the Contra Costa Immigration Rights Alliance, where he serves on the 
Internal Coordination Committee. Ali is also a founding member of the Contra Costa County Reimagine Public Safety Campaign. Ali, thank you. Thank you so much, Sean. I'm so excited about this conversation um, because as you know, and you see every day in the news, um, issues of immigration are uh, really top headlines these days. And there's a lot of um, layers to it. And there's a lot of politicization of what's going on um, today. You know, you see the news um, of, uh, you know, migrants seeking safety, uh, being uh, bused to New York, and what's going on with that. Um, we see, uh, you know, regardless, this isn't a partisan issue I want to note as well, regardless of, um, you know, what party is in the federal administration, um, we have uh, serious, serious issues with access to due process, access to humanitarian relief, and access to rights for immigrants coming to this country. Um, and in California, uh, we really are a um, leader nationally um, and internationally in uh, seeing what the future can look like when you have a multicultural uh, economy and society that has uh, immigrants as a really critical part. And I think that uh, what this conversation is about is about co-creating the future of um, America, frankly, and what role uh, all of us have to play, including immigrants, um, in a more just future. We have such a great panel for you all today. I couldn't be more thrilled. Um, these are um, folks that I've known for a long time and whose uh, passion, commitment, and dedication have all taught me so much about what we need to do to move forward in community um, and really come up with proactive issues. You know, these are really personal issues as well. And so we're going to start uh, today with um, having folks share a little bit about uh, what activated them to this work. Um, and I'll start with myself uh, before I introduce the other panelists. So I myself am, am an immigrant. I was uh, born in Iran. I'm, I'm an Iranian uh, American. And I came to this country uh, like many people, like many migrants that are coming now, due to um, sociopolitical factors that made it necessary for my family and for my family's safety to uh, to leave. And we were fortunate enough to um, get out during the um, Iranian revolution. Um, and we settled in Southern California. Um, and so I had this really personal experience as an immigrant um, who comes as a young immigrant to the country um, of being kind of traumatized by the, the rapid move and the total change, but then having to adapt to the systems of uh, belonging and othering that uh, really make up what it is like to be an immigrant in, um, in this country. So I grew up in Southern California. I went to a very um, diverse neighborhood that had other folks that were also dealing with trauma, both trauma from uh, many immigrants from the countries that they came, but also from trauma through lived experience in the United States. And so what was important to me as someone that always wanted to kind of belong and find what, um, you know, without a country that to call your own, what, what does it mean to be here? What does it mean to be part of America and be part of the American dream? And to me, it really comes down to belonging and community and working with others to do good work and really take accountability and responsibility for the society in which we live and everyone in our co community, especially those that are most marginalized and most kept out of power. And that's the way that I've taken the approach to belonging. And these other three individuals that are with me on this panel today are my family, they are my community, they are what makes me feel like I belong. And I think the key to these really difficult issues is combating what is the 
the most dangerous part of the immigration debate is that it's people are coming to it from a place of cynicism um, and there's a lot of alienation, you know, especially as an immigrant, you, you feel alienated. And there's a lot of cynicism with how um, broken the system might be. Um, but the way to combat cynicism and alienation is not to double down on it, but the antidote to cynicism is positive hard work um, and positive action. And the antidote to uh, alienation is community. And so I am so proud to introduce you to the fellow panelists here, um, starting with Sandy Valenciano. Sandy is so incredible. I met Sandy uh, years ago when we were actually starting the um, Stand Together, not Stand Together, Contra I'm sorry, the Contra Costa Immigrant Rights Alliance. And Sandy and I go way, way back. Um, but I'll, I'll let her share some stories. But before we do that, I, I do want to note that Sandy is just an amazing advocate. And you can check out her, her bio in the materials, but I think it's more powerful to really allow Sandy to share like I did what, what brought her to the work. In my case, it was my own immigrant experience and then politicization that came out of the uh, hostage crisis and then the first Gulf War, um, the racism that I experienced, the exclusion that I experienced, the lack of belonging and I decided that I needed to really um, address those issues. And so Sandy, uh, for you, what, what brought you into this work? Yes, hello everyone. Thank you so much for having me again. Um, so great to share space with uh, Deb and Yoel and Ali. Um, so yeah, I, I was uh, raised in Contra Costa at, um, I went to school at Antioch High School and um, I came into this work being part of the Undocu youth movement. Uh, when I was in high school, looking at opportunities to go to college, I had many of my college counselors tell me that they really didn't know what to do with me um, because they actually weren't exposed to a lot of undocumented youth at that time, or so I thought. And so I had many of my college counselors tell me that they really didn't know what would be of me, how they could help me, um, because at that point, there wasn't any services for undocumented youth in the ways that they exist now. Um, and I didn't really want to settle for that answer. Um, and I think it was me trying to prove me prove them wrong that um, really ignited me to try to think about what does it look like for me to navigate um, seeking higher education on my own. Um, and so that led me to my journey of going to Sonoma State University, uh, where, you know, I, ha I had to struggle a lot with being a full-time worker and also being a full-time student um, because I didn't have a choice. Um, there was no way for me to be able to pay for my tuition. And um, in, in that experience, I, I learned a lot. I always, uh, I work with young people now still, and um, one of the things that I always tell young people is when you're young and you experience oppression, it kind of feels like bad luck. You know, it kind of feels like, why is bad, you know, why are bad things always happening to me? Why isn't things going my way? And that was very much my experience being an undocumented young person in Antioch in Contra Costa County was that I just always felt like we were in situations where it didn't feel like it was our fault. And unfortunately, um, you know, we we got the the short end of the stick all the time. Um, my parents are undocumented. Um, my older sister's undocumented. Um, and so we very much had an undocumented um, migrant experience um, living in Contra Costa. My parents are still there now. And, um, you know, I, I always think about uh, how I wish there would have been someone there for me who could have uh, um, empowered me in my vision. And so, you know, that's why I'm, I'm very connected to this work. I've been, I was a youth organizer. I started organizing when I was 18 years old. 
and I am 30 now. So I've been organizing for the past 12 years and I am so lucky that I get to work with young people in my current capacity and I get to be that person that I wish I had when I was younger. Um, I'm very, you know, I started off with this work, obviously trying to or organize to um, have more opportunities for undocumented youth, but that led me to much bigger issues and a much bigger fight that I'm so lucky that I got to be part of with my colleague, Deb Lee, who I've been doing this work alongside for so long, um, and Yoel and Ali, um, and just having the opportunity to be able to curate spaces that make people feel like they belong in their community. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's what brings me to this space. Um, and thank you again for having me. Thank you, Sandy. Sandy taught me so much about organizing and Sandy is really, um, you know, I didn't go through her very impressive bio, but um, Sandy is at the middle of so many of the things that make California and the Bay Area leaders in really having a immigrant um, centered, human centered, compassion centered approach to making the changes we got to do. And Sandy is somebody that just gets it done. She, she, Will is relentless, and I'm just so glad that you're here, Sandy. Um, so I think uh, next we'll uh, go to Reverend Deborah Lee. Um, Reverend Lee has worked at the intersection of faith and social justice for over 30 years in popular education, community organizing, and advocacy concerning issues of race, gender, economic justice, anti-militarism, LGBTQ inclusion, and immigrant rights because all of those things are connected. She has consistently sought to strengthen the voice and the role of faith communities in today's social movements. Um, and she works with the um, Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity uh, and has helped build a network of 250 congregations, 2,000 faith leaders, and 250 community partners committed to immigrant justice and ending mass incarceration. Reverend Deborah Lee is a true leader and a, and a champion and a person I'm really grateful and honored to call a friend. Um, you can look at the rest of her bio and the materials. Um, but Reverend Lee, what, what brought you to the work? What, what brings you to this, to this love work that we do? Thank you for the introduction, Ali. And and Sandy, I can't believe Sandy's only 30. She has done so much. <laughs> and it's been, you two, in, in, you two in Contra Costa have been amazing because you really centered a lot of your work in Contra Costa County. And I've worked with faith communities in Contra Costa County, so I know how important it is, some of the institutional infrastructure that you've helped to build there. So just a little bit about what brought brings me to this work. I, I think certainly uh, it begins with a bit of my own family history. I had the lucky roll of the dice to be born in this country. So I am a, um, a citizen of this country um, and was born in the state of Ohio where my parents immigrated separately uh, from two different Asian countries. My mother immigrated from Indonesia in the height of a political turmoil and a coup. So she came to the United States for safety as many people still come to this country today. My father came, they didn't know each other. So my father came from a different country, uh, from Hong Kong. Um, you know, he was the oldest male in his family and to support his mother and his brothers and sisters, he came to this country to work. And so they met in the state of Ohio and that's where I was born and spent the first few, first, you know, 18 years of my life. And so I consider myself in some ways a refugee from Ohio to California. <laughs> And some of you may know what that what I'm talking about. So especially if you're Asian American. So um, so certainly some of my thinking about immigration comes from that background, but also an awareness that none of that would have been possible had it not been for changes in immigration laws that took place in the 1960s, that part of the civil rights movement that was calling for racial equality, that allowed for cha some changes to happen um, where my where my parents could even come for those reasons. So I am really indebted and grateful to that. So part of that centers, um, part of my commitment to this centers on that. And also uh, you know, upon arriving in California and really understanding the history of California, how much of when we talk about immigration, how much is laid upon this foundation of immigration policy um, and vitriol that was against Chinese Americans and Asian Americans 
you know, over a over hundred years ago. So some of our very first immigration laws and our very first immigration detention center at Angel Island here to enforce the Chinese exclusion uh, laws. So that, you know, kind of binds me to, to this work in, in, as well. And then I think, you know, on a very, um, in a more immediate way, I'm, I am a pastor and I began this work as in youth ministry and worked with many youth. And it was through actually youth ministry that I, I was hearing story after story about how young people's lives were being turned upside down by immigration policy. Um, one, one young boy, you know, his mother was deported on Christmas day. Um, another young woman who, like Sandy, you know, was an undocumented young adult who had a dream of being a doctor. She ended up self-deporting because she'd already gotten four AA degrees and thought, I'm never going to be able to become a doctor. She waited for President Obama to be elected in 2008 and, you know, one year, two year, three, nothing changed. And so she ended up self-deporting. Um, her family's still here, but she's, she's in another country that she left when she was two years old. So I've seen, and I... Um, it, I wasn't even primarily working with Latino youth. I was working with, um, with all kinds of youth, but I could see that the ways that immigration policy was affecting young people's lives. So I realized at that moment that immigration justice is really one of the key civil rights issues of our day. And this was something that I had to be a part of. And as a person of faith, um, this is a, a calling for many of our faith traditions around how we welcome the stranger, how we walk with the newcomer, how we don't see national identity in that way, but we really see the humanity of all people across borders. And so that's been some of my commitment. Some of my work in Contra Costa County has been with working with congregations there who were helping to um, really save lives and accompany immigrants who are detained at the West West County Detention Facility to help immigrants who are starting their lives over upon release or newcomer families, asylum seekers, but really trying to create a network of support that our government does not have for them and to fill that gap. So I'll share more about that later. Thank you, Reverend Lee. Amazing stuff. And you can see um, you can see what brings us all to this work and, and how important the values that we bring to it and community and communication is. And that's why we're so grateful to be able to share this space with uh, all of you in the audience as well. Um, next up is Yoel Haile. Yoel is an organizer and advocate who has worked on immigrant rights, criminal justice, and education equity for over a decade. Yoel works to support Eritrean refugees and asylum seekers resettle in the U.S. as his um, in the U.S. That's in his spare time. In his day job. Yoel is the director of the criminal justice program at the ACLU of Northern California, working to end mass incarceration and police violence. We're so pleased to have you here, Yoel. And um, you know these issues facing immigrants, as we'll talk about more, are completely intersectional. It's not just about immigration law or immigration policy. It's about how we treat each other and the systems that we create as a society to help everybody thrive. Yoel, welcome. What brought you into this work? Thank you, everyone. And my apologies that I'm on my phone. I'm trying to switch to my laptop and I'm on the other side of the world where it's 2.30 a.m. my time. Um, but uh, my name is Yoel. I am from Eritrea. I came to the U.S. when I was uh, a little bit over 15 years old um, as an immigrant. And uh, my, my father had sought political asylum there and we followed him. Um, and that's how we arrived to the States. <laughs> um, and as a result of that experience, uh, so much of you know the work we've done has been, um, you know, all of it really has been about immigration, about figuring out you know, how do you apply for a green card, what you know, what's the process for citizenship when people come, like what's their asylum process like, what do they need, what did we need um, to get our papers right, um, and so because it's you know it's it's part of just your everyday life you you have to know how a lot of these processes work um, which most of them are terrible very time consuming uncooperative federal agencies um, but all in all um, 
you know, that's how uh, my involvement in the immigration space um, started. And I just remembered as Sandy was talking that Sandy and I met back in like 2015 or something in the basement of like the city of Berkeley because we were trying to get them to divest from these private prisons that were being used uh, both to incarcerate people and as detention immigrants at like 8 p.m. at night in the most obscure place um, in, in Berkeley. But um, yeah, that's... Um, and then, you know, I remember to, to the point also Sandy was making about um, her involvement during college and organizing. Um, I went to college at a time when there was like mass student uprising and, uh, and movements um, around tuition increases, around like education accessibility for, you know, those of us who are low income and were on like financial aid on school, people who are undocumented and who couldn't get any grants or financial aid. Um, and my closest friends and, and people I organized with the most during those times were people from uh, pe students who are undocumented and, and we were all trying to fight for the same goal of trying to make education um, a reality for, for everyone. Um, and, and I think because of our, you know, related immigration experiences, we, you know, we bonded over our like, you know, shared struggles and kind of shared objectives. Um, but that, that's how I came into this work and now I've stayed in this work. Thank you, Yoel. We are so grateful for the partnership. Yoel is one of the best guys I know, just such a, such a force. Um, so now we're going to kind of switch it up and go into more of a conversational kind of round table, you know, the view kind of situation. Um, and so anybody feel free to jump in as, as we're discussing things, but, you know, some of the things that, uh, the themes that have come up a little bit, you know, Reverend Lee and Sandy, we're both talking about, um, and myself, we're talking about issues of, um, criminalization and detention and kind of what is the relationship between the a lot of the narratives that we hear coming out of the immigration debate and um like detention and criminalization and stuff so i don't know if um uh, you know sandy for example i know you've done a, a lot of this work and had a lot of personal experience with this stuff are there any stories or anything that you want to kind of share with with us in the audience that can kind of shed light on the reality of um, what these systems look like, particularly the the pipelining to deportation and the detention systems themselves. Yeah, thanks, Ali. I'm also just realizing that there's a former high school teacher that's here. And I, yeah, I'm having this moment because oh. I, yeah, I, um, you know, I, I think, when I think about like why we do this work, it's about, as I mentioned, like really trying to create a space of belonging for people. And I think there are structures that make it so that folks don't feel like they belong here. And ultimately, whether it's create the conditions that force people to self-deport or create the conditions that narrow people's opportunities from the options and the choices that they can make, which allows them or if not pushes them to interacting with the criminal legal system and then therefore um, the deportation system. Um, and um, like, you know, I was, I mentioned, you know, I, I grew up in Antioch and uh, during the time that I grew up in Antioch, um, I felt like there was a, a lot of policing happening. Um, I, you know, I remember my experiences of uh, immigration being spotted and we wouldn't leave our house for, a, a long period of time because that was a real fear. Um, and we knew people who were being impacted by immigration enforcement locally. Um, my my experience is more directly is, um, you know, I have my, my father, he's a, an Afro-Latino. And so he appears as a black man. And I remember growing up and my father would consistently get pulled over by the police and during that time, um, undocumented folks did not have access to licenses. And so what would happen is that every vehicle that my family had, it would get confiscated by the police. And we were once again, unable to have a vehicle to be able to get my father to work, to get me to school. And so I grew up 
what I felt was like always being surveilled by the police because that was the experiences of my dad. Um, and I grew up also experiencing my uh, mother and my father being in arguments because my mother, she's a, a much more fair complexion. Um, and she would say, why does this always happen to you? And I would experience even that tension between my own parents, my mother not fully grasping that my dad was appearing as a black man to law enforcement. Um, and uh, another experience that um, has impacted my family is, um, you know, I have family all over the state of California. Um, most of my family is actually in Fresno County. And um, we, we, my parents and I, um, we stayed in, in Antioch Contra Costa. Um, but not too long ago, um, I had a cousin who was um, struggling with substance use, and he was sentenced to a substance abuse facility, a re rehabilitation home. But because there wasn't enough beds, enough space at this rehabilitation home, he was forced to stay at the local county jail in Fresno. And now Fresno actually has an office where ICE is able to come in and out. They basically have a desk at the jail. So unfortunately, what ended up happening was because my cousin could not get a spot at the local uh, rehabilitation home, um, he was then put into ICE custody was detained at Adelanto Detention Center and was un unfortunately then deported. So when we think about like who are immigrant communities, what are migrant experiences, there's just so much nuances to who we are, the experiences that we hold, the, um, the racism, the discrimination. And when I, when I think about, um, you know, what are the conditions that are, communities are experiencing, especially as we're trying to come out of COVID. It's just all, you know, how do we figure out uh, understanding that people know that not just migrant communities, but poor working class folks are always constantly a paycheck away from not being able to make their rent. We're uh, not being able to make our rent in the Bay is a situation away from losing housing. Um, losing housing is, you know, a situation away from being houseless and that so forth, you know, running into situations where, you know, sometimes, you know, the option is doing an action that puts us closer into contact with the criminal legal system. And, you know, then there's the pipeline to detention and deportation. So I think people think that, um, th there is this good and this bad immigrant narrative when really there's not, because we're we're all a situation away from ending up in the criminal legal system. And unfortunately for undocumented um, non-citizen folks, we're a situation away from being put into detention and deportation. And so that's the really bigger picture that I think we need to grapple with is that um, the conditions are forcing people into situations that is placing people in these pipelines. And I think that's what we need to come to terms with. Yeah, I, I think that's, first of all, thank you for sharing all, all of that. I, and I, I think that that gives the, you know, at the end of the day, the reason we all do what we do is because of, of people, of human beings, is because we see day to day how these systems operate. And that's one of the things that we wanted to get across to everybody is just come see for yourselves. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But, but on that issue of kind of like belonging and exclusion and kind of good immigrant, bad immigrant, um, you know, what kind of migration is okay? And what, in terms of like the political powers that be and what kind of migration is, um, is looked down upon? Um, and how does that map onto things like the socio-political realities of the world, as well as the realities of race and racism in America? Um, I think those are really interesting issues. Uh, Reverend Deborah or or Yoel, do you have do you have some thoughts on on that? Sure, um, I can add to that. Um, well, I 
I do think it's really important when we think about immigration, it was so helpful to hear the League of Women Voters position on, on immigration issues. And um, I agreed with much of what your position is. Um, I think I want to like kind of highlight a few aspects of that. And one is, um, you know, I think when we think about immigration policy, it's always kind of related to colonization. And we have to remember that almost all of us on this call are probably immigrants and, or settlers and settlers um, or people who were brought here um, to indigenous land. And once that indigenous land was colonized, they lost control of their own migration, their own migration policy. Um, so the migration policy that we have today as a country is one that is, you know, really uh, the colonizers immigration policy and over periods of time that has sometimes wanted immigrants here because they wanted people to work or to settle the land um, to settle the land and to support the expansion of, of that settler land um, or they've needed laborers so they brought in um, whether it's contract laborers, Chinese contract laborers, Mexican contract laborers, Filipino contract laborers, or they've brought in slaves um, and trafficked people into this country. So the immigration policy is, is one I think it's a helpful to kind of look at in the broad view. And I think that what we're seeing today is echoes of that, of what have we've, you know, what the history has been. Uh, where it's sometimes yes, sometimes no. It's like, how are you useful? How are you not useful? But I think for if we want to center this in the, the human experience and centering it to how human lives are impacted, um, I, we have to kind of, one thing I want to focus on is that how it, right now we're in a period of exclusion and expulsion and extermination um, because we are enacting deadly policies of deterrence towards immigrants um, at the border, on the way, escaping their home, on their way to the United States, that would be the extermination, extermination, deadly policies inside detention facilities. The expulsion is the deportations, um, uh, ways we're removing people from their communities. We're, um, and then the exclusions, the exclusion, not allowing people to really fully live in society free of fear with full access to what it means to be a citizen of this country, to be able to vote, to be able to participate, to be able to um, you know, be engaged in this democratic society that we want. You know, we want this country to be a place where everyone is engaged and has a voice. So um, I don't wanna get too off track, but the, what I see is like this pattern of exclusion and expulsion and extermination. And so one of the pieces in Contra Costa County, I'm gonna to try to bring it in more local right now, you know, has been, and my engagement, you know, in Contra Costa County had been focused on the detention center, which was the contract that the county had with the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Department of Homeland Security uh, for about $5 million a year to house immigrants because they were out of status or did not have status in the West Contra Costa County Jail. And so that is a symbol of how we have decided to approach migration, which in many ways is a human issue. It's a human response to climate change. It's a human response to danger. It's a human response to move and to migrate. But our country has decided to respond to it in a way that criminalizes migration, meaning we throw all the tools of criminalization at it to try to solve it. So we try to arrest people. We try to put drones and you know, and military at the border. We try to put a wall. We try to put people in jail. We, so we've tried to like criminalize our way out of this issue and it hasn't worked. It hasn't really prevented migration and it certainly hasn't worked on the human level in that it's destroyed many lives and families. So after a seven year campaign in West Contra Costa County, um, that detention center closed in 2018. And I wanna just share one story, one Contra Costa story about that. In 2018, before the closure, I got a letter in my office from a man who was detained at West Contra Costa County. He came with a visa. He actually had a visa in his hand and arrived at San Francisco International Airport with his visa. And when he was going through customs, as you do, as anyone does when they come through international flights, he went through customs. They started going through his stuff. They started questioning him, probably because he was from an African country, probably because he was black. I think if he was from uh, you know, a, a European country, that probably wouldn't happen. 
And they started interrogating him and they're like, well, if you're here as a visitor uh, with a visitor's visa, why did you bring your nursing certificate graduate, you know, diploma? And so they started, so after two hours of interrogation, he ended up on the floor in chains, his computer taken away, his watch taken away, his phone taken away. And that night he spent the night in immigration detention in, Contra, in West Contra Costa County. Um, uh, and so he wrote to me, he'd been detained for two weeks. And he said, you know what? My family has no idea where I'm at. Is there any way you can communicate with them on Facebook so they don't think I died in a plane crash? Because he had not even been able to communicate with them when he landed. And so that conversation, you know, led to us trying to advocate for him, praying for him, praying with him. People in Contra Costa raised money for his bond. People showed up for his court hearing. Um, and after several months, he actually was able to be released on a 5,000. He had to pay $5,000. The community raised that money. He was released. A family in Contra Costa County housed him. And Justin said, I'm not done. Justin is his name from Nigeria. He said, I'm not done. He said, what about my buddies who are left inside? Right. What about Erkenbot from Mongolia? What about um, Fernando, you know, who's from Mexico? What about these? Guys? He's like, you have to, you can't stop with me. You have to keep going and we're going to keep going. Uh, so I just wanted to say that this is a story of someone. Well, Justin has ended up staying in Contra Costa County. That doesn't always happen. People kind of go wherever they can find a job or they have someone they can find housing. But Five years later, Justin, not only through the pandemic, he worked through COVID in two uh, in county hospitals, our mental health wards in a county hospital through COVID. And now in, in Pittsburgh, he has opened up his own home care facility for people, adults with disabilities. So this, he did not have to be this way. His whole experience of coming to the United States to figuring out if this is a place where he could stay, if this is a place where he could contribute his gifts. Uh, it, it didn't have to have this whole period of detention, this four year nightmare of a legal case to be able to now say, okay, I can be a permanent resident. I can open up this business. I can help people in need, you know, with, with mental challenges. Um, but he is like, to me, an amazing success story for Contra Costa County. So, our goal is we don't need to have to put people through this trauma to welcome them, to have them be part of our communities. And we have so many needs in our communities that they can help us together figure out how we can fulfill. Wow, thank you for sharing that story. Um, that's the kind of um, community building that I was talking about. And that's people like Justin um, are the ones that uh, we, we want modeling um, a truly inclusive, uh, loving society. Um, Yoel, we haven't heard from you for a minute. Um, what would you like to add? I just wanted to raise two points to, to the stories that were shared. And one is that um, refugees and immigrants are created by material conditions in their home countries. And those material conditions for the most part, um, especially in places all over the third world, were and are still today constantly created by US foreign policy that decides to go to Iran and creates destabilization, that decides to go to Indonesia and support a dictatorship, that chooses to go to all of these places all over Latin America where they overthrow democratically elected governments um, and put up people who would do their bidding who would destabilize the country, make it impossible for people to live there, um, and then end up coming here, right? And the the kind of cruel irony of it is, is that once these people come here as a result of what was done by this country or what was aided and abetted by this country's policies and dollars, when once like people arrive here, how they're dealt with is also like total disregard for human life completely trying to criminalize people, arrest people, try to you know, send them back to the very same conditions that this country helped create. Um, and I just wanna emphasize that point because it is not in a vacuum that people are just choosing to get up and like walk and take these life-threatening journeys to bring themselves and their families 
that doesn't happen in a vacuum and, and the context in which that happens is that there is active both under like Republican and Democratic uh, leadership in this country that has been consistent in its foreign policies um, that constantly tries to push war, to push destabilization, or to sacrifice the masses of the people in a lot of these countries so that the, the people in power can do the specific bidding of what is called US foreign policy interests. So I wanna highlight that point because when you talk about Afghan immigrants, when you talk about even now Ukrainian refugees or refugees from all over Latin America, Asia and Africa, all of those things have sp the specific context of constant US involvement that has created these conditions. Mm -hmm. um, the second point that, um, that came to me was that I looked at a, at a reporting that said that for Afghan immigrants, when they were applying, like right after the US left and abandoned thousands of people who were interpreters and were otherwise worked with the US military over there and left them essentially to die there, uh, people were allowed to apply for various visas that they had to pay hundreds of dollars for, which cumulatively came to millions of dollars for to USCIS that were ultimately denied or never got a response from. But then we saw a different path for, I believe it was for Ukrainian refugees and other refugees from Europe who got to apply without having to pay those. And those fees are expensive. These are like most USCIS forms are like $1,000 or more. Um, who didn't have to apply those fees, who, who had it waived and had a much faster, much more expedited um, you know, immigration process to the U.S. where people can come here and get their you know, work permit and all of these things on day one. And here we are dealing with immigrants from all over the world where we can't even get their work permit for two years. So they have to try to find work under the table, then try to find housing because they don't have credit history. They can't just apply to any housing option that's there because nowadays you have to apply for housing, have a credit score of like 700, have like two months deposit and first month's rent and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but essentially like a set of conditions that make it very, very difficult for people to live here, to take care of their families and all of that. And there is a clear like racist disparity that happens in terms of which immigrants does this country want, despite the fact that which immigrants this country is creating by way of its involvement in, in the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Yoel. That's, that's a really, really key point. And I think uh, to, to kind of bring us around to kind of what can we do about this and what are we doing about it? Um, you know, I want to note that, you know, the, the current refugee and asylum system was really a response to the 1951 Refugee Convention. So uh, the Refugee Convention is a basically a treaty that the United States has signed on to and most countries on the planet have signed on to. And it came up after the, the Second World War where the world was in shambles and people had to migrate. And um, so there was an agreement made because of the horrors of how refugees were being treated around the world, that there are rules here, that everybody has to agree here to a set of rules of how we treat immigrants that present themselves at your border and say that, hey, I need protection. Um, my, my life is in danger if I'm returned to my country. So the Refugee Convention is directly a result of political activity and a decision after World War I. And that means it's part of the law of the land. Uh, US treaties are have the same effect as the US Constitution in terms of the law. But what's happening right now, um, not only in terms of immigrants that do get here, and you've heard stories of what we have to deal with when we get here, but the tens of thousands of people that are displaced are migrating and are coming here to find a better life um, and are languishing at these uh, really unlawful under international law systems at the border is, is really bad. So I know that there's some questions, but before we quite get to the questions, I just wanted to make sure that we 
kind of bring it back to a positive frame because we've talked about a lot of the problems, but there is so much good work going on about this. And I really feel like myself personally, as an immigrant, I feel like it's part of my way of belonging here in the United States as, as an American is to address these issues and to act as a bridge between um, immigrants and non-immigrants to, to show that really immigrants are some of the bravest, most resourceful, loving, family-oriented people that I've ever met. And so I just want to say that these are exactly the kind of people that I want to be in community with. Um, and so before we get to questions, what are ways in which people in our audience that want to kind of tap in or take action, what are some thoughts or a thought from each of our, our panelists about um, what to kind of, what are ways that folks can tap in? And if there's any final burning thoughts that any of the panelists want to want to kind of tack on, this is a good time to do it. So um, unfortunately, I had some tech problems, so I'm on my phone, so I can't see the rest of the panelists. So um, any of you just jump in with some ways that that folks can tap in. Yeah, I'm happy to kick us off here. Um, and I mean, I just kind of want to re really reiterate Yoel's point that like if we could stay in our homes we would stay there you know like I I constantly walk around with a lot of grief feeling like I don't have a home you know and that I've had to figure out how I find home within people because I don't have that luxury of having a physical home yeah. whether it's you know I'm a DACA recipient and so whether it's like I don't know if my work permit's going to get renewed next. I don't even know if that is going to exist, you know? And so that constantly lingers over me. And I think that almost feels like a punishment in itself is not having the privilege of being able to plan five years ahead of me. You know, I, I work in the increments of how the system has structured me to think about it. And, um, and I just want to emphasize that because I think when we think about, well, they got a visa, like they're fine, you know, um, or their order of deportation got stopped, they're fine. And it's like, it's it's not fine. You know, we're constantly being surveilled um, and constantly being um, put in situations that really limit our ability to actually be able to thrive um, in this country. Um, but on the <laughs> uplifting note, you know, I, I do want to make an invitation to folks um, that everyone here who is present has an opportunity to shift the narrative of, of people's perceptions of who are immigrant communities that are deserving or, um, or you know, counter the narratives of who isn't deserving, because really that that's all a construct. Um, like I mentioned, no one. Um, and even if folks did choose to leave their home, um, you know, I, I hear these um, narratives about, you know, people are coming here to steal people's jobs, you know, um, people are coming here and, you know, bringing drugs or people are coming here and, you know, living lawlessness, you know, hearing all these narratives when that's, that's actually not the accurate story. And I think, all of us here are people who are part of spaces where you probably hear those narratives. And I just make an invitation to folks on what would it look like for you to um, really center the dignity of all people that everyone should have the right to move. Everyone should find have a right to have a home. Um, everyone should have a right to be seen as who they are. Um, and narratives is so important because they inform policies. Um, I mean, look at the Trump administration, you know, and, and how that gave a trickle down effect to localities. Um, and, you know, I also want to encourage people to pay uh, close attention to how the uh, migrant system is mirroring the criminal legal system and how much entrenched there is this culture around punishment, around carceral solutions. Um, and we cannot unsee that. Um, and how do we work at um, shifting the ways that we look at um, 
you know, folks who are arriving into this country. I um, I know we're going to get into the question portion, but, you know, I, I did peek there that it's just like, you know, what is the solution? Um, and I think what uh, all of us have a role to play, and I hope that we all really see that. And I know we'll get to some of those responses. And um, yeah, so, you know, I, I really want to challenge folks to think of, you know, how could you challenge the narratives, whether it's when you're having dinner, those uncomfortable, you know, things taking dinners, you know, you have with your families or, you know, whatever spaces you're part of is really challenging the narratives and the misconceptions people have of migrant communities. Thanks, Sandy. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's one piece that everybody can do right now and not just um, counter those narratives, but be aware of them, right? When you're seeing these news stories, don't take the headlines for, for what they seem like. Kind of look at who stands to gain and what do they stand to gain when they're using the immigration issues and the real um, life issues that are facing um, immigrants that are in this country, but also migrants that are making these perilous journeys to find safety for their families. Um, why is there so much vitriol? What do people have to gain? What is it about this that um, is being used as a distraction? I think that's that narrative piece and that um, critical thinking is really key. Um, what about some practical uh, ways to tap in? I mean, one thing I wanna say is on that point of um, criminalization is, uh, you know, there's a really good bill pending right now, AB 1306, passed the Assembly and House. It's called the Home Act. Um, it's at the governor's desk right now. Um, so one of the things that you'll get in the resource guide is um, some connections with some organizations that do um, that work on this stuff. And so encouraging Governor Newsom to sign the Home Act, which prevents double punishment of immigrants who are incarcerated and have already served their time and have been found to be eligible to be reunited into the community and be reunited with their families um, to make sure that they're not uh, robbed of that opportunity to come home once they've served their time um, simply based on the place that they were born um, because that's wrong. And so that's one place that you can do some traditional kind of uh, legislative advocacy. But what about other ways to, to tap in on a more personal level? Um, you, you, well, you do a lot of work with, uh, with newcomers. Um, what, what do you think are some ways that folks can tap in? Yeah, um, I mean, the most common ones are the ones that everyone generally also struggles with, finding housing so you can have a way to, to be stabilized um, and then finding employment. Um, and then, you know, tapping in into existing social services, like being able to apply for benefits, healthcare, et cetera. And I think concretely, if, you know, people are able to connect with nonprofits who serve like immigrants, newcomers, and are able to either provide housing or, you know, provide jobs or help them even, um, even if people are taking like, like an hour and a half out of their day to help people navigate how to apply for your health benefits, how to enroll in like Medicare or Medi-Cal or any sort of like healthcare services, um, how to find housing, giving people rides even so that they can look for jobs, right? Um, I think that like, you know, if people are able to volunteer to help one or two immigrants with the concrete things that they need for like, you know, three to six months until they can get a job, they can get housing, they could kind of get into the basic benefits that they're allowed to have um, that makes a huge difference for like two reasons one it like stabilizes the individual and whoever the individual supports like their siblings their children their spouses etc and then two it helps them like once they know how the system works that one person that you helped is going to go and like help 10 other people to do the same thing that he or she did because they know how to do it or they'll bring them to you so you can show them how to do it. So the like the multiplier effect of like helping one person at a time is massive because you can help like two people in one year or three people in one year, like all the way through the following year, there's gonna be like 90 other people who are affected by each of them. Um, so it really like pays off massively when we just take the time to do it um, with like one or two people. If you can do it with like 10 people at a time, that's great. You know, it's hard with everyone's commitments. Um, 
but taking one or two people and doing it well and connecting them to kind of everything um, pays off massively. And I think it's a concrete way people can get both play a supportive role, but also this is how we all learned how terrible all the systems we have are because they're hard to navigate. They're not easy. Even when you fully understand English and you can follow stuff and you can like apply to all the right things, it's still really difficult. Um, but you only learn how difficult it is when you're actually trying to help someone how to do it. Um, so it's a way to both like learn how the system works and also to have like real positive, like long lasting impact. Mm -hmm. That's great. And I know there was a question in the chat of like, how do you recommend that people tap into that? Is there, are there particular organizations that you want to shout out right now or sh could folks contact you to get, be, get put in touch? What, any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, yeah. So I mostly work in the East Bay. So I think Ali probably knows all the Contra Costa organizations and he can share those. Um, but the Oakland kind of Bay Area organizations some of the ones I work with, I, I can uh, put in the chat and, and share with, or feel free to email me and I'll um, connect you to folks. Great. Reverend Deborah. Yes. I want to just add, like, I think that what's really key is empathy and understanding. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure you're cross, people are crossing paths with immigrants all over. And I think taking the time to really uh, think about how am I deepening my understanding and trying to have more empathy um, and to really accompany people. Um, our organization, the Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity, we do organize accompaniment teams. So teams of people who can um, help walk with someone who doesn't have a family member, doesn't have a guide, you know, there's no handbook, but help accompany someone who's new to this country seeking asylum or newly released from detention, you know, seeking protection, but they're, and they're just trying to get their feet on the ground. So to walk with them, to help them figure out how to, you know, how to get their kids in school, how to ride the bus, how to look for a job, how to do all these things, how to show up for immigration court so you don't get deported for not showing up, you know, all how to read the paperwork. And most of our volunteers are not immigrants, so they've never seen this stuff before, but they can read English. So it's a, you know, it's a lot easier. And just, I think the benefit of it, as you all mentioned, is to start to really understand what our immigration system it really is for people. And it's, if you, if you haven't been through it, you have no idea. And so I think this is our tax dollars. This is our, this is, this is, you know, these are the system that we voted in. And so we should take responsibility by knowing what it is and knowing its impact on people. So if you're interested in um, accompaniment, accompanying a, a person or a family or hosting them, a housing host, that's our organization. Um, we are, we, you know, we turning people away and we're like, well, wait, just wait till we find some new accompaniers or a new housing host. So we would love to have more volunteers and supporting in that work. I think that's a beautiful, beautiful way for people to tap in. Um, and I, I think that um, the other thing that I'll add to that is um, there's going to be a, a kind of a another conversation with the League of Women Voters um, early next year, um, kind of more focused on the new uh, deportation processing center or so-called immigration court that's coming to Contra Costa County in downtown um, Concord in the heart of the Monument Corridor, which is a heavily immigrant um, populated area. And one of the things that uh, I think will emerge from that is opportunities, not only for accompaniment um, through uh, all of the things that Reverend Deborah and uh, Yoel mentioned, but also uh, court watch, right? The, the best way to really see hands-on in some ways how these asylum cases are playing out and what's going on is to actually go to the new immigration court that they're going to build and go in there, sit down, watch how it's working and how it's not working and pay attention to all of that um, and get involved. So um, I just wanted to name that stuff, but I know we've gone a little bit over and we want to address questions. As I mentioned earlier, uh, I am having public defender life tech problems because our computer system went down 
So I'm on my phone. So it's difficult for me to uh, read the chat. So um, were there questions? Um, I know there's been questions coming through. Um, can any of my co-panelists who see a question that they wanted to address just kind of like pick one and then I will go through and look at some as well to see if there's legal ones that I should be chiming in on. I'd like to take one that talks about, um, you know, oh, the immigration detention system isn't working. What's our vision for that? I want, I do want to share our vision. I mean, our vision is that immigration detention does not exist. It actually doesn't need to exist at all. Uh, people uh, are able to sh go to court, to show up for court, to like go through their legal proceedings without having to be detained that whole time, which sometimes takes up to four, you know, I've seen people have been detained for four years, sometimes more. There's no reason why. Um, so that's not the reason. And um, so I, I, we're really questioning why immigration detention even exists. Um, and it shouldn't. And I want to proudly say, you know, and Sandy has been part of this, and Yoel has been part of this too, that, you know, 10 years ago, there were 12 immigration detention centers in California, and now there are six. And we're hoping that number continues to go down. It's part of national efforts and states all across the country to close down immigration detention centers because they don't need to exist. They are part of this idea of deterrence and making people's lives so miserable that they will hopefully not come, but we know that the forces that are causing people to come. And it's not the, it's not the, the, it's not the coyotes, it's not the traffickers that are making people come. People would not be coming and leaving all of that if there was not, um, you know, real push factors uh, for them. So that's part of our vision, no immigration detention. The other thing is that all the billions of dollars of our tax dollars that we're using to militarize the border and to support detention and, and, and de deportation that so many more needs that that money could be used for in terms of housing and environment and healthcare. And when we think about like, oh, people are taking our limited resources. Well, are our resources limited or are our resources being used for other things that actually if they were distributed differently and we weren't spending billions of dollars on these other things, but on human needs, actually we would have much more of an economy of abundance. Thank you, Reverend Deborah. Um, I'll, I'll jump in real quick and answer or try to address, um, you know, well, actually, I, I was I was hoping that maybe Sandy could could touch on this, but there there was a question about the mental health impacts of all of the uncertainty uh, around being um, an immigrant in limbo in the system. And I know, Sandy, you had touched on that. So I imagine that that um, that that was uh, addressed partially to you. Um, you know, there's there's not only mental health impacts, but also health impacts as well. Um, and so, Sandy, do you have some some thoughts to share on um, on those aspects and how how real that is? Yeah. No. Thank you for that question. That's also the question that I wanted to address. Um, you know, I think we're really lucky in California that. Um, through some um, actually efforts I was part of, there's not been an expansion of health access, but it's on a very limited scope. Um, and so I definitely invite you to um, take a look at some of the initiatives that folks are leading statewide in order to expand the access to healthcare. Um, and there's also ways that you could do that locally. Um, at the local county level, there's something that's called emergency scope. And emergency scope is basically a pot of money that um, is up to the discretion of the county on how to use it. Um, and so, you know, when um, if you feel called to um, uh, continue to push on your board of supervisors to um, expand um, services and resources for undocumented communities. Um, I mean, here in Alameda County, there is, we have a, a program um, that is not limited to folks who have, um, a, you know, a status, you know, anyone can access services. Um, and so thinking about like, what would that look like in Contra Costa? Um, I also had the privilege of, um, for the past uh, now two years, I've been running a small cohort um, called the Right to Heal Project um, across detention centers where I've led a cohort of folks to um, work on how they can um, heal while in 
um, detention center and what does it look like for them to um, unlayer all of their trauma and experiences um, and how to how to find a place of empowerment and self-fulfillment. Um, and so that program has paused um, for the time being, but I say that to say that um, letter writing is so important to people in detention center. Um, sending money to people's commissary like it oh. it really goes a long way and I um I would I would do this activity with folks through the program where um I would make a wellness packets and it's anything from like word searches to like prompts and um it really goes a long way because as uh Deb uh shared you know these facilities are created so that it forces you to sign your voluntary removal. Like that is the goal that to, to isolate you, to abuse you, to, you know, take away all of your um, autonomy in order for you to sign that paper saying you want to leave. They want to stop you from being able to fight. And so um, I encourage folks to connect with Interfaith uh, for Human Integrity to Pangea Legal Services, Centro Legal de la Raza, um, the Dignity Not Detention Network, ICE out of California, Asian Prisoner Support Committee, um, Interfaith for um, uh, uh, Inland Empire Coalition, I was going to say Interfaith, uh, for Human Integrity, but also Deb's um, organization, and just let her write. It, it just literally goes a long way, and it keeps fueling people's will to fight their removal proceedings. So, yeah. Thanks, Sandy. Um, I saw one question in the chat. I thought it was a really, really good one um, about, you know, that part of what we're saying here is to make an effort to, to get to understand immigrants and to connect with immigrants, um, but that some people have been told, well, don't ask an immigrant where they're from. Like, don't just come out and say, hey, where are you from? And, and that so that people feel uncomfortable sometimes with that. And you know, this I'm just speaking for myself right now uh, about this issue, and I'd love to hear what other panelists think. But I I think that people are not one identity, right? So my immigrantness is a big part of who I am, but it's not all of who I am, right? And when I'm first meeting somebody, if the first question out of their mouth is "Where are you from?", right? As someone that's experienced racism. And, uh, you know, I don't know this person yet. Like, it, it might not get us off on the right foot because, first of all, I might not be ready to share that with you. Second of all, I might be afraid that you have an issue with people from your on um, or things like that. So that's not to say, though, that the correct answer is when you see somebody that you think might be an immigrant, like, turn the other way and don't talk to them, right? The idea is still engage, still connect ask me my name, ask me what I'm interested in, ask me where, like, what I do, all of that stuff. And once you make that human connection, um, then at that point, when you're in the flow of a conversation, right, you can start to tease out whether or not, like, being an immigrant is a big part of my identity. Most likely, I'm going to bring it up once we get to know each other <laughs> pretty early on, just period, because it is a part of my identity. So I just want to encourage, I want to thank the person that asked that question for being brave and asking that question. And I want to say that um, I'm somebody that because I struggle with alienation and belonging, I want to talk about things with people that don't have a shared experience with me. And so I think take care with not putting somebody into a box and being like, oh, there's an immigrant, I wanna to get to know them because I wanna be good about immigrants, right? Like, it's not a human way to really interact. But when you get to know somebody, at least me, at least, I'm speaking for myself, as long as it doesn't feel like you are reducing my identity to my immigrantness or my immigrant status or something like that, but that you're trying to get to know me and understand me better, that's the condition in which you will get to understand me and know me better. And then we'll talk about things. And all immigrants, all immigrants are different. Some people might not be comfortable talking about that early on. And you'll need to follow their cues and give some space, but still be in relationship and build that relationship. And then the, the, the rest will come in time. 
Um, so I just wanted to, to mention that for that question. I, I think there was also a question about uh, the, the border. I don't know, Yoel, uh, I don't wanna put you on the spot, but um, if you have a, an answer on that, I, I do have a, a particular uh, thing about the border, which is what's going on right now with the border, in my view, is just simply illegal <laughs> um, in terms of international law. We, we signed that, we learned some really hard lessons after two world wars that, you know what, when people are coming and showing up at your border and asking for help, we're all going to agree that we're going to at least give that person some process, right? That we're going to let them in. We're going to give them the protection as we figure out what's going on with them and whether or not they qualify for the protections that all of these countries, like it's over a hundred and something countries in the world have agreed to, including the United States. What's happening with the border policies of the past two uh, administrations is simply refusing to follow international law about how we're supposed to let um, deal with asylum seekers. The situation at the border is asylum seekers lawfully protecting themselves and following the rules of what is expected to come and present yourself at the border and say, I need protection. What's supposed to happen is that they let you in, they begin the process, and then you get connected with some services, and then the process goes through there and you get a work permit while your case is pending. That's how it's supposed to work, and that's how it worked before the border was politicized the way it is. Uh, and so I just wanna say that the answer um, to one of the big issues at the border, which is what do we do with the people that are presenting themselves and seeking asylum, is simple. Follow international law, follow the refugee convention, let people in. I wanna just add, there was a question early on about a follow-up to the story that I shared about the person and it relates to your story, Ali. So the person who I talked about, you know, who came to SFO, he, he did what he was supposed to do, which is to show up at a lawful port of entry at like the airport is one, the border is another, and to ask for asylum. So he, but the only way he could get here, he could either go the long way, which if you're coming from Nigeria, you have to somehow get to this other continent and come all the way up through Mexico and get to the US and risk your life. And so there's people doing that at the border. He was able to get a tourist visa to come to ask for asylum in an airport. And when they find out he was asking for asylum, that's when they detained him. So our policy in response to people, you know, doing this the right way, you know, in, in terms of international law is then to throw them into immigration detention. So I just wanted to follow up that piece. And I think there's so much that, you know, it's not just one little fix. We have to kind of re-envision the whole thing. And that has to do with what Yoel was talking about, about root causes. Like we really have to address the militarization all over the world. We have to address climate. Those are key, two key primary drivers that are happening. We have, to, we have to address the inequity between countries. You can't have a country where you could make, you know, where you like you, you can work for a year and make what you can make in a month in this country and then expect people not to move. Like you cannot have that kind of global inequality. Uh, so we have to address those things like in the long term and in the big picture. And then we have to stop doing the things that are really uh, killing people and creating lifelong trauma. Yes, I, that's that's such an that's such an important point, uh, Deb. I think I I really feel like the issues that we're talking about. You know, we we've talked a lot about kind of stories and. The, the human elements of this, because I think that's what's getting lost, right? And that goes back to what we talked about, about debunking these narratives that are coming out. Um, it's only going to get spicier in the news as, you know, uh, the, the powers that be use, literally use immigrants as a political football. Like, they're literally putting people on buses and, like, throwing them around and putting them in these terrible, terrible positions to use them 
in the power struggles between the the major parties or whatever, however you want to think of what the U.S. politics are, we as immigrants are being used as a prop. We're being used as um, a prop and it's really, really dehumanizing and there's lives and families on the line. And so when you see these um, narratives, what we ask you to do is dig deeper, look at it from a human lens, get involved so that you meet people that are going through the system. Some of these suggestions that were made, like, you know, and, and it's not just the immigration system. It's what is the experience of an immigrant that's trying to do all of these other things that we all have to do, put their kids in school, get medical care. You know, you, all of these things are stacked, unfortunately, against immigrants. Whereas the, the thing to debunk is this myth that immigrants are coming to take anything away from anybody that's here. We're not, we come in peace, we really do. We're, we're here, we, we want to work, we wanna have a better life for our families just like everybody else. And immigrants, especially in California, are, are really a major, major part of what makes this state um, my home and the place that I, I call home. And so I feel like the issue of belonging is at the center of this in a very real way. And in Contra Costa County, for example, you know, over 25% of the population of Contra Costa County are immigrants, are foreign born, okay? So this isn't like a small population we're talking about. And many of the people in the audience might not realize how many of their neighbors, the people they run across, have these deep, rich immigrant stories that have only been touched on by the four of us as kind of a proxy for the richness and the strength of what immigrants are dealing with and what migrants are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, both as they risk their lives to find a better life, hopefully here in this country, and then what they go through when they get here and the systems dehumanize them, criminalize them, and use them as a political football instead of meeting the very human needs and helping us uh, integrate into a rich and diverse um, California and Contra Costa County that we can all be proud of. And I see that there's a question regarding the um, deportation center. So I know I just spoke, I don't know if anybody else wants to touch on that, but I know I'm probably, um, does anybody want to talk about the new deportation processing center coming to Concord? I think you're the best one, Ali. <laughs> okay, um, well, so that, that's gonna be the topic, um, the teaser. This is a perfect setup. Thank you for whomever asked that question. Um, we're going to go really more in depth into that um, at uh, a future League of Women Voters panel in March, I believe. Um, that new deportation processing center is set to open in um, February. They've already signed the lease to the Gateway Center in Concord. And uh, what's happening right now is we're all getting together and figuring out the game plan. So the legal service providers, the uh, accompaniment organizations, the rapid response networks, the immigrant rights advocates are uh, going to be getting together and having a convening to really figure out if they're going to build a large, there's gonna be at least 20 new courtrooms. So that means that they can process many, many more deportations. That if this place is going to open, what can we do to make sure that it has our Contra Costa values. It has our California values. And it has our human values that we've discussed today. How can we ensure that the people that are processed through that facility have access to due process? Because people don't know. That's why I'm encouraging court watch. People don't know that in immigration court, you don't have the right to the government to pay for an attorney for you if you can't afford one. So that means most of these asylum seekers most of which don't even speak English, are left to fend for themselves in this really complex system. And so this new deportation center 
processing center is going to be a big deal. And we want to ensure that if it's coming to our community, we need a community response that welcomes those that are those community members of our that are that are being processed there. Um, and so that's where there's going to be a lot of ways to tap in for um, accompaniment, court watching, volunteering, and so forth. And so, um, you know, and if we do it right, hopefully we can get some good results. You know, I, I think I, I'll say I run a program called Stand Together Contra Costa. And uh, that's a program that I'm very proud to be a part of that's run by the county of Contra Costa. We partner with nonprofits to fill this gap because the, the federal government doesn't provide immigrants who can't afford an attorney an attorney when they're going through these deportation proceedings. Contra Costa County has decided to show that they stand together with immigrants. And so we have immigration lawyers, myself and all my staff, that are going to be able to represent people in these cases. And what we find is that when immigrants are actually represented, and especially when they're given good representation, their outcomes are so much better. Somebody that goes into an asylum case without an attorney tends to win about less than 30% of the time. Whereas nationally, if you do have an attorney in an asylum case, you win uh, over 70% of the time. And right now what's going on with the influx of asylum seekers is my program right now, I'm really proud of this number, we have won so far 93% of our cases. And that's because these people that are fleeing for their lives aren't here to try to steal jobs or lie and get one over. They are fleeing for their lives. And that's why 93% of the time we're winning people the, the, their right to detach from this oppressive system and get integrated into our community life. So um, I just wanted to say that. And uh, with that, I want to thank the League of Women Voters for having us today and turn it back over to our gracious hosts. I'm sorry if we went long. Thank you, Ali, for all of that wonderful information. Um, on behalf of the Contra Costa County Library, League of Women Voters Diablo Valley, the League of Women Voters West Contra Costa County, and CCTV, I want to extend a genuine, a genuine thank you to each of the panelists for sharing their time with us today and for giving us such an informative and timely conversation about the realities of immigration. And also a big thank you to Pamela Perales, our Spanish interpreter for all of her work today. Ali, and this is his contact and the name of his organization that he founded. Thank you, Reverend Deborah Lee. Many of you were, were trying to catch up on what was the name of of her organization and you have the site there. Yoel, thank you so much for being here today and Sandy for all of the work that you do and, and what you shared with us. I also wanna thank each of you for joining and for asking important questions today. This community conversation, what is the reality of immigration is being rebroadcast on CCTV on the following days and times. Community conversations, what is the reality of immigration will be on the YouTube channels of the League of Women Voters Diablo Valley and the Contra Costa County Library. Please save the day for our next community conversation on October 19th at four o'clock, Income and Wealth Inequality, Pathways to Balancing the Scales. Community conversations programs are a partnership between the Contra Costa County Library, the League of Women Voters, Diablo Valley, League of Women Voters, West Contra Costa County, and CCTV. The League of Vot Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization encouraging informed and active participation in government. The League never endorses or opposes candidates or political parties. We influence public policy through education and advocacy. We invite everyone to join the league and support the work we do at lwvc.org slash join. Thank you so much. Have a great evening.